I want to talk about no. Uh, and I want to start off by talking about, or I, I guess I want to start off by telling you a small story. About eight years ago, when I started going out on my own freelancing, um, I got approached for a project. And uh, this was a project that I did with a friend of mine named Kevin. And it was for a big clothing company. I won't say who they are, but. Um, We'll say it's one of those ones where the people, like the really attractive people in swimsuits stand out front. Have you ever seen those stores? Well, okay, I don't go into those stores. But it was for a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, they approached us with this project and I thought, okay, well I'm just going out on my own and if I take this project, I'll be set up for a while. I won't have to worry about anything. I can just do this project and sort of, you know, float myself along doing what I want after that. So I figured a lot of money, I don't really care about the client or the work per se, but I'll do the project. And from the get-go, I knew that uh, the client was a little weird. He sent us these really long emails that were just rambling, like all these problems and restrictions and, and all these requirements of things that we had to do on this project. Uh, and he was also a little bit I, scatterbrained, I guess. Just random tangents and just saying weird things all the time. But Despite all this, my friend and I, we talked ourselves into it, and we took the job, and we start working on it, and uh, in, in, a, in an amazing bout of forethought, we didn't get paid up front at anything for this. Um, yeah. So we start working on the job, and we do, we do a bunch of work, and we, we give it to them, uh, and it was only supposed to be a short project, maybe like three months. So a few weeks in, we give them some deliverables, he seems like, you know, oh, that's okay, you know, some revisions, we give him some more. And he's like, all right, now I need to go take this back to my boss. And here, up until this point, he had been presenting himself as the, the top tier person. Uh, and it was at that point that we found out that he was not. He was trying to sell this project internally. So he disappears for like a week. He just goes completely dark. And we can't contact him, no email, no, no calls, nothing. And uh, he finally gets back to us and he said, yeah, this isn't, this isn't working out. We need to you know, do all of these other things that were out of scope. And uh, we say, all right, you know, as long as we're, we're still heading in the right direction, we'll do this stuff. We make more revisions, more revisions. A few weeks pass, we hand them off. He goes dark again for like a month now. He just completely disappears. No calls, no emails. We finally get in touch with him. And he says, yeah, we need to cancel this project. It's not working out. It's not really what my boss wanted. And we had no connection with this boss or anything. And uh, at that point, he goes dark again. We're like, all right, let's get a kill fee out of this guy. And he just is not responding. Once the topic of money comes up, he's just gone. Uh, so what turned out to be, or what started as like a three month project, we're into like seven or eight months now. and. Before we actually got in touch with him again, we had to go get a lawyer, make the lawyer write scary letters and send him scary letters to scare him into contacting us. And when that finally worked, we got a little bit of money out of it. And all told, this was almost a year and a half's worth of time. And the entire time this was going on, I was a ball of stress. There was nothing but stress. I was waking up in the middle of the night, worrying about when is this project gonna be over? Am I gonna get anything for this? It was just screwing up everything. And what I realized at that moment is that I should have listened to my gut in the beginning. I saw the dollar signs and I thought that maybe that was a good decision. I could make these compromises and I could just float along based on this one job. But I realized that I, shouldn't, I should listen to my gut. I shouldn't have made those compromises because all those red flags were very much like screaming at me right in my face the entire time and I just ignored them. And I want to talk to you a little bit about saying no because I know that this stuff is really, really uncomfortable. Not a lot of people know how to say no. 
they're not comfortable saying no. I know that some of my studio mates and friends ask me, you know, should I take this job? Is this good for my career? These types of questions. And if for some reason they think that I know better. <laughs> and I, I, I've gotten around to saying no a lot. And it kind of started with that story. Because I realized that I don't need to take everything on. I don't need to take every project. I can chart my own course and do the things that I want to do. And we don't talk about this stuff a lot because we're all sort of in competition with one another on some level. You know, we're all designers and we're all fighting for the same jobs, but these are kind of, a lot of people think of them as trade secrets. You know, haha, you didn't say no and now you're screwed. And now I get this awesome project. <laughs> and that's not the way that it works. We should be sharing this stuff. And you should know that when you do something well, someone is choosing you because you're on the right track. You have not reached an end point. It's actually a great compliment to get chosen for a good job because it, it's confirmation that you're doing something right. You have not reached an end point and by saying no to that project, all good jobs don't just dry up all of a sudden. And right now, my time and my attention are my most valuable resources. They're not in any way renewable. I can't get back more time. I can't get back more of my attention. If I choose to spend those things on something, it has to be worthwhile. I'm also going to, to quote Frank here because I think that this is a really, really good way to put it. I can use that time and turn it into money just by doing work, but going the opposite way doesn't happen. I can't turn that money back into time. That time is gone. I want to give you permission to say no. I know that this is really difficult. And I know depending upon where you are in your career, you might not be able to say no. And that's actually where I wanna start with this. Depending upon where you are in your career, you could be right out of school and you really don't have any options. You have to say yes to everything because you have no reputation, you have nothing to back up. But also depending upon where you are, you could be a mother with three kids or a father with three kids, a house, a mortgage, you can't always say no to stuff. And I get that. So this is going to be different for different people. This is my own personal journey to saying no. But I know that not everyone has the flexibility. But it comes with time, it comes with age, and it comes with experience. <laughs> you might think that just by merit of me being up here t telling you to say no, that I've, maybe I have reached some magical plateau of awesome clients. And that's not the case. I get contacted by the same crazy, wacky people that you do. <laughs> I get all the weird emails. All of the same people come to me. This never goes away. No matter where you are in your career, whether you're starting out or whether you're you know, 30 years in, you're still going to get all the crazies. But this is really an opportunity. By saying no to something, you're able to say yes to other things. So some of the questions and the caveats that I always have, especially when you're starting out, there's the obvious stuff, like do you need money? Do you need food? Do you have a roof over your head? This is the real world stuff that you, know, you actually need to consider. And obviously, a big caveat, the one where you throw all of your reasoning away is when the awesome client comes your way, someone that you've always wanted to work with, that musician or author or whoever it is. They come your way and you're like, all right, I'll do this for no money. I'll do this with a crazy deadline just because I love this thing so much. And that's one of the things that you, you take on and you, know, you hedge your bets, I guess. So my own path to know is, is really summed up very well by this Benjamin Franklin quote, which I, I love. At 20 years of age, the will reigns. At 30, the wit, and at 40, the judgment. And while I'm somewhere in between the last two, I kind of consider myself, at least age-wise, I'm somewhere in between the last two, I kind of consider myself more on the judgment side now, I hope. So my own age of will, what was that like? Saying yes to everything. Like I said, you have no experience, you know nothing, your name is worth nothing, you have to say yes to everything. And that's okay because you really don't have anything else in your life when you get out of school. And my work day was very different then too. I would go into the studio, nine o'clock, work until six o'clock, and then I would come home and do the same exact thing past midnight. That's all I did. But that kind of time, while it's crazy to me now, was amazing then, because everything that I touched was just experience. Also, I wasn't a grown-up. I'm just barely maybe one now. 
And uh, I, didn't, I didn't have any of that real world concern, you know, no house or family or any of that crap. I just could do work. And I had time and energy in massive quantities. This is all that I had. If I just threw enough time and energy against something, I could solve it. Flash forward to the age of wit. I've had some successes, some things have gone okay. And clients are coming to me based on those successes. They see the work and they're like, hey, this guy might know something. And people are starting to approach me rather than me hounding after them. This is fantastic. But I start realizing there's like a cloud over my head. And I start saying things like, oh, if I only had time to work on that little project, that idea that I had, if I only had a little bit of extra time, I'm spending so much of my time in my day working for these clients and other people that I don't always have time for the things that I want to do. And these two words start popping up, either in my head or around the studio and friends, burnout. When you do something that you love so much that you start to not love it as much anymore. This is a dreadful thing. This is, this is the worst thing for a designer. And now, hopefully, I consider myself into the age of judgment. Like I said, my time is very, very precious to me. I scrutinize heavily anything that I let into my life because it's going to take me away from something else. And I have enough experience now that I have some perspective. I can see the long game. I can see that if I say no to a certain project, if I keep doing good work still, more will come my way. And not working that day where I go in at nine and go to sleep at three in the morning, that's what keeps me sane now. Before that used to keep me sane, and now not doing that is what keeps me sane. And I'm allowed to work a lot smarter now. I realize that I don't need to be a generalist. I can focus on specific things and be really good at that thing and not need to be just okay at a lot of stuff. And now I say no to almost everything. Almost everything, because I need to be very, very specific about the things that I want to do and understand the path that I want to be on. So why is saying no really hard? Why do people have trouble with this? A lot of it comes down to fear. I mean, we all have these fears. No matter if you're working with clients, if you're internal, you're working at a company, we all have fears of saying no. Fear of missing out on something good. If you don't take that project, you're going to miss out on that amazing opportunity or it's going to catapult your career into the stratosphere. Fear of not having money. This will always be a concern, especially in New York. Fear of what someone will say. No one likes saying no. No one likes hearing no. What if they yell at you? That's kind of totally scary in a client relationship. Like, I don't want that. I don't want someone yelling at me because they want something you know, positive from me. Fear of never getting another job again, being considered a hack, having your friends and family disown you, being the laughing stock of your creative community. This is a very real concern. I'm afraid of this all the time. But it doesn't come down to one decision like this. These fears, while they're valid and we all have them, are unfounded. By saying no, you're giving yourself options. You say no to something so that you can say yes to other things. And it allows you to focus on what's really important, to really focus in on the things that you want out of your career, and allow you to fill your life with the people and the experiences and the things and the projects that you really love, things that really will further you and make you want to be a creative person over and over and over again and not burn out. Over the course of my career, I've identified pitfalls, red flags that when they pop up like that first story, that when I see them, I know that this is a disaster. If I were to take this job, it would completely go tits up. And if uh, this job does come my way, I'm almost certainly going to say no. So these are my pitfalls, my red flags. You probably have your own, uh, but these are the ones that I always watch out for. First up, I mean, first impressions are totally everything. If someone comes off weird, if they're a little loopy, whatever your gut says, that flight or fight instinct is almost always right. Trust your gut. Crazy long emails from crazy people. <laughs> I'm sure you get these too. Emails that are just book length, rambling messes. And they're telling you their life story, their problems, what they need in their website, all the marketing materials, and the people above them that are giving them a lot of crap and, and pressuring them. And they're just filling up your inbox and they just dump it all into yours. It's, it's crazy. And equally as bad are short emails. Emails where they don't really say anything. 
like this, this is a real email that I got. Like don't text speak email me, speak like a person. What this tells, I'm going to translate this for you, what these tell me is that I don't respect your time and I am a very bad communicator. Hello. I hate this. This is amazing. I get an email and it just says hello and then rambles, it launches right into the crazy. My website, my, my old website used to look like this and it has my name huge up top and huge down the side and my URL is my name and you have to like traverse all this stuff, get to my about page and contact page just to get in touch with me. And if at any point in that process you can't maybe glance and see out of the corner of your eye a name, what this tells me is that you probably did send this to 20 other designers and you're just spamming their inboxes too. Or, equally as bad, you don't care about details. This is not going to be a good relationship between us because I want to give you wonderful things and design you wonderful things and if you are not sensitive to those, this is not going to work out. Also along that process, if they have to traverse your entire website, and they can't spend two seconds to read a small paragraph about what it is that you do, and their email consists of, hey, do you do cold fusion? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Can you start tomorrow? This is one of my favorites. This, ha this, this eclipses everything because all of a sudden your emergency is now my emergency. You've just shoveled this into my lap. You had this for weeks and you just sat on it and you didn't think that it was that important, but now your deadline's coming up and oh crap, we need to get a designer to look at this. But what it really comes down to is respect. Understanding that this is a, this is a, a, a back and forth. We have a relationship. I'm a consultant and you need something that I have, something that you're unable to do with your organization. So this is an equal partnership and I should be treated with respect. You should be treated with respect because we should be equals in this. So giving you permission to say no. Some of the things that I consider when I'm thinking, you know, is this something I'm going to take on or not? I think about who is the designer that I want to be? Who do I want to be in five years or 10 years? I'm not necessarily talking about your five year or 10 year plan, that stuff, but just what kind of person do you want to be creatively? Do you still want to be designing in five years? Do you want to be a web designer? Do you want to be a book designer? Start trying to point everything that you do in that direction. You're not going to get everything to go in line yet, but start pointing in that direction because the more that you point in that direction, the easier it's going to be to actually get there. If you keep designing tons and tons of banner ads, people are only going to come to you to design banner ads. Would I put this in my portfolio? And all this really means is like, would you put your name behind this? Everything that you do is, is going to serve to get you more work. So keep trying to do the work that you want to do in the way that you want to do it and then reinforce that by showing that to people. That's going to be your calling card. And of course, is the money enough? Not just is there money, because there should be, but is the money enough for what it is that you're being asked to do? And really the litmus test for me always comes down to, is this going to be nourishing? Is this something that I'm going to learn something on? Am I going to get some knowledge out of this project? Because that's one of my most valuable things that I can get out of a project is something new, some new knowledge. If I keep doing projects that teach me the same thing over and over again, I'm going to get really bored. Milton Glaser has his, uh, his 10 things that he's learned in his life. And one of them is about avoiding toxic people. And it's basically, you know, if you hang out with someone and they're toxic and you leave, you realize you're feeling diminished that they've actually taken something away from your life. And he says, get those people out of your life and you know, only have nourishing people, people that lift you up, people that make you want to see them again. And I feel the same way about projects. If something doesn't feel right, if it doesn't feel like it's nourishing you creatively, socially, mentally, try and get it out of your life. And ask a friend, just as friends would ask me, I ask friends all the time because their brain is not clouded by all of my own insanities and, 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 and complexes that I have about my own work and should I take this project or not. They can just tell you, no, the guy's a weirdo. Don't take that project. <laughs> this is something that I do a lot. This is not a typo. I have a program on my computer called Text Expander, if anyone uses that. When I type our reply, it spits out a nice and courteous declining email. I address the person by name. I can fill that in. And then I just tell them very politely, I'm not taking on their work, that's cool. 
I appreciate it. Here are some friends that might be able to be uh, might be able to do this job, and then it's gone. I say no, and I can forget it. And that's a huge amount of stress just lifted off my shoulders because then it's gone. I don't have to see it in my inbox. It's just gone, and I did something nice. And really, just trust your gut. Know that when you have these feelings, when you feel like something isn't going to go right, you're right. Trust your gut as much as you can. So, you might have that story that I started out with about the, the crazy client and someone who um, is just very aloof and you're worried about money and the contracts and all that. You might have that story. You might not, but you're going to. And I mean that in a good way. It's a very good rite of passage. All of these bad experiences add up to good experience because you're not going to make that mistake again. And building each time that you learn from good and from bad, it's going to make you into a better designer. This is my front door. I want to leave. I want to go outside. I want to experience things. I'm a creative person, and I want to experience the world. That's what being a designer is. And I can't be strapped to my computer or worried about these things round the clock, because then I don't get nourished in the same way outside of that. Your career is not a sprint. This is very much about the long game. Making one decision is not going to change everything for good or for bad. Know that when you make these decisions, you're trying to set up a path that you want to be on. And I can say no to these things now because I've regretted saying yes in the past. Just like that, that story I started off with, I have many, many more where I've screwed up. I've made tons of mistakes. That's just what happens in this career, especially when you're trying to do a lot yourself. But you're on the right path. Like I said before, these projects that you take on, they don't shape you. You're the one who shapes what kind of designer you want to be. And that confirmation of being on the right path, of doing something well, is getting jobs, is getting offers, is getting attention for the things that you make. And more of that will come if you keep doing good work. You don't have to say yes to everything just to feel like you can float yourself along and be supported. There's a lot of good work out there and a lot of very smart people. Thank you.